Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Hello. Uh, welcome to our arts podcast, Painting of the Week. <laughs> I'm Phil. <laughs> and I'm Laura. And uh, hello to all our friends in... We've got a list. A lot of countries. A lot of countries. Okay, so... Australia, New Zealand, Slovakia, Slovenia, Thailand. Yes. Norway. Norway. India. Uh, Hawaii. Yeah, United States. British State. Virgin Islands. Yeah. Portugal. <laughs> Portugal, uh, Spain, Canada. France, Germany. Say we don't mention somewhere, it's going to be really bad. Um, so we need to... And plenty more, anyway. Yes, and on... if we haven't mentioned you, we're sorry, because it, <laughs> I think it was quite overwhelming. It was good. It was good. Mm. Yeah. Right, so we have chosen <laughs> to um, look at an artist today called Howard Hodgkin. And what's the paint you chose this week's painting, Laura? So what is I it? I did. Mrs Acton in Delhi. Mrs Acton in mm. Delhi. Um I think it's a brilliant choice and I particularly like it because I didn't know it at all. So <laughs> it's 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 quite good fun when you are introduced to a new painting and you have to kind of work it out. I mean, Howard Hodgkin I certainly knew, um, but this particular painting I didn't know. And forgive me if it's one of his most famous, but there you go. Well, no one's going to be surprised that I didn't know it, are they? <laughs> Well, you chose it. <laughs> I chose it. But well, why, I did, why did you choose it then? Because uh, I looked at all his others and thought, oh, I'm going to have to help, like, get involved in chatting. And then at least there was a figure in this one. But I think I have mentioned it before. I do love a bit of quilting. And mm. I love the colours. And uh, so instantly I was drawn to it for a few sort of fabric choices. But then obviously I went on to some of his later things and... Oh. Yeah, that's very interesting. Mm. So actually, I mean, hopefully, I know that some of you listen to this podcast, you know, driving or running or walking, so you can't immediately look at the painting. <laughs> when you do get a chance, and you or if you are looking at the painting now, you can immediately see what you're pointing out about the textiles. Yeah. Um, so Howard Hodgkin, Howard Hodg Hodgkin is, for some one of the great British artists of the 20th century. Um, an interesting painter in the sense that he's almost one of a kind, something that I think he reveled in and probably slightly resented as well, that there wasn't the kind of school of Hodgkin. Uh -huh. um, I'm not really expert enough to, to, to know about that. I, but um, again, like with some of the other artists we've talked about, there is a style that pretty much if you saw a painting without knowing it was by him, when you've looked at his work a little bit, you would start to think to yourself, oh, that looks like a Hodgkin. And in this case, it therefore probably is a Hodgkin, which I think is uh, a compliment to him. Uh, he died um, not so long ago, 2017. Um, we were actually working with the National Portrait Gallery on a forthcoming Cezanne exhibition when he died um, because they were just planning or they were just about to open a Hodgkin retrospective. Oh, and, in, and he died? I think he, I think just he, he died just before, uh, I think. I don't know uh, the exact timeline, but it was around the same okay. time. Um, and uh, so what do we see in this painting? What do you see, Laura? Well... Can we just start off with a week of what it's been like to look at his paintings for me? Yeah. Uh, you know when sometimes you think you're lucky in life? <laughs> Somehow I've ended up on this podcast with you, which I still don't quite know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then you said, OK, let's do Howard Hodgkin. And I was like, OK, obviously everyone's not going to be surprised that I didn't really know much about him. And uh, just came home and was oh, I've absolutely <laughs> blown away. I just love his paintings i love them and i've been lucky enough to spend the week looking at them and the colors and everything about them so this painting 
just is just so it's just lovely the paint the, the, the colors it's gl- glorious so what is it you like about him? the other i mean in general what is mm. it you like about his style it's, I, it's, I think i do love color it's quite abstract isn't it yeah but then there's a slight geometric mm. which i do like because i make a well i say like make a few quilts so but i believe his more abstract works which yeah. can sometimes just be strokes of color Yes. Across both the frame and the and the yeah, I mean, I I don't really know wouldn't know how to describe what I'm looking at, but there were I think I told you in the week there was three that I liked and they were a small series, which, but I think they were later on where they were ice cream, mm. raspberry, and a fruit crumble mm. and glass of red, but if I had to spend half an hour talking about them, I don't, I'm not sure. That I'd be able to, so I'd have to have you sit next to me, Phil, to help. So. Well, it's, it's it's always an interesting conundrum for us as filmmakers because when we do, if we make a film about a Raphael, you can talk about a particular Raphael painting for fifteen minutes. Mm. Well, you can. <laughs> no, well, no, not, no, 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 but, but I'm, I'll be putting the kettle on. No, but I'm nothing compared to the kind of experts that we talk to, and and in you know, some of those more complicated or detailed narrative works, representational works. You know, you can talk about, you know, Leonardo's Last Supper. You could talk for ages about that one painting. If you, if you, if you then have an abstract painting, which is just a few strokes of colour. Yeah. Well, to give you a, a concrete example, we were thinking about doing a film about Rothko. And I'll be honest, one of the thoughts that went through my mind was, well, I mean, how long can you stare? I mean, how long... Can you hold up? Because some of these paintings are just like two tones of colour. So yeah. how long do you look at it? And there's not, how much detail can you actually hold on the screen? What are people going to say? Yeah. What, how does it differ? I mean, apart from the fact that the tonality and the chromatics will differ from painting to painting, but is there much difference between the paintings in a broader sense? So you now there are some that will argue you can talk just as much about Rothko paintings you can about Leonardo I'm actually not sure now with Hodgkin some of his works are just strokes of color I think it's really interesting already because you've told me the titles oh yes now let's think about titles for a second Mm -hmm. so when I've made films about great composers or great artists one of the clues about the history of that work is is the title okay but we have to be really careful. A lot of the names, for example, of Mozart's works or Beethoven's works are not given by the composer. They weren't given by Mozart or Beethoven. They're given later when the, when the works enter the world of commerce and they need to be described. So um, oh, there's so many examples. Moonlight Sonata, that, was, that doesn't come from the composer. That comes later. So we have to be careful not to attribute the intention of the composer on the titles that these things have now. Okay. Similarly with paintings, often the titles come way later. Often artists don't actually title their works. So you have to be quite cautious about thinking, you know, starry, you know, starry, starry night or starry night or whatever. I mean, these are things where people are, as a painting is traversing the complicated world of, of dealers and markets and auctions, oh, okay. then it's easy just to call it a particular name. But didn't Howard Hodgkin... So, oh, sorry. So sorry. Howard is different. Ah, OK, go on then. So the question is, mm. num- those paintings that you just talked about... Yes. Mm-hmm. Was it apple crumble? Fruit crumble? Fruit crumble. Fruit crumble, fruit crumble and... Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> so take away the titles. Yes. Would you have identified them as fruit crumble and ice cream? Probably not. No. So I find it really interesting with Hodgkin that he would he famously would never let anyone see him paint. No. He would famous for not really wanting to talk about his artworks. No. And yet he gives them titles, which is a major clue. Yeah. So this painting that we're talking about this week, um, if we didn't know this was Mrs. Acton in Delhi, you'd have no idea it was in Delhi. No. You might even struggle to see it. A representation of a of a female form. Um, you might even, if you didn't know about Hodgkin's love of India, even struggle to know it was India. Yeah. So, 
The fact he's giving these clues in the title, this information in the title, is, I think, very interesting. And for me, because I like to understand what I'm looking at, frankly, so I'm, I'm happy to have... For me, the title says an awful lot. So that's, you know, because a lot of contemporary art, I get a bit frustrated with it because not only will it not necessarily be even titled, but the artist will then say, well, I'm not going to talk about it. You know, it is what it is. OK, leave it to you. Now, there'll be differing opinions on this. My own view is, no, that's a bit lazy. Mm. Yeah, OK. And, you know, when I get questioned about why did you do X and Y in a film, I could say, well, because... That's not not really very helpful. So I'd rather put it out there and probably over explain why we didn't edit in a certain way or why we use music or why we filmed something in a certain way. The trouble with that, of course, is that then you are, you're kind of um, perhaps revealing too much and you're getting into the nuts and bolts and taking people away from, from you know, their own visceral, emotional, yeah. personal reaction to something. It's quite nice that we've all got our own reaction in a way. Yeah. But he took years, didn't he, sometimes to paint some of his yeah. paintings. So maybe the titles even came later? So it'll, be, it'll be interesting to know at what point he typed. I mean, I guess something like this. He, straight away. He must have been yeah. thinking. I mean, I don't think he did sketches. Well, I watched a documentary in the week, obviously. <laughs> Try and get myself up to speed. And, that, and that, there was... However much I like Howard's work, I don't think we would have got on because there was quite a lot of scenes where he's just sitting and observing and uh, and I'm quite chatty. So... Howard, talk to me. <laughs> Howard. I would, though, wouldn't I? I'd get on his nerves <laughs> because there's a lot of scenes in, I think, one of the documentaries where he's just really yeah. taking it all in. They're saying he doesn't, he doesn't sketch and he takes it all in and I'd be just, like, coming up. So I'd say, Howard... You know, no, what a great! But he, he was he was brilliant, though, wasn't he? Because he could he would sit, yeah, and he'd say, "This is working." I mean, if you could pull that off, God, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just sit. Let's do it, Phil. <laughs> I mean, he was he was he was really oh, yeah, clever. Let's do it. <laughs> that documentary, I, is that the Alan Yentl Imagine one? Yes. So absolutely brilliant. So he's he's basically he's so clever. He said to them, "No, I'm not giving you an interview. I'll tell you what we can do. Yeah. You fly me business class to India." <laughs> we'll wander around my favourite places, <laughs> probably stay in fanciest hotels yeah. for 10 days and mm -hmm. you can feel me working, which means sitting. Sitting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what a... Come on, you've got to be I able mean, to do that this. that is just... <laughs> that is brilliant. It is brilliant. But... Well, he's obviously was working because... Yeah. I mean... India was his love. So, and... Those colours are amazing. I think you've got two ways of reacting to a Howard Hodgkin. Mm. I mean, this one, again, there's a bit of narrative in this, so it's 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 um, slightly different to the one. My brother has a has a just a you know a poster from a gallery, but he's got a big poster of, of a Hodgkin. In fact, Laura, I didn't even realise it was a Hodgkin. It was just a thing he had in his room, which was very colourful. Oh, and I mean, that's amazing. It, I know. Did, you, did you only realise this week? Or was it before? Uh, he's just moved. Oh, okay. And it's just, he's put it in a different place. And I, I said, that's remarkable because you've got Hodgkin and we're going to be talking yeah. about Hodgkin. Oh, no, don't, don't start with the coincidences I know. again. Actually, There's so many. We have to. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so. Yeah, no, come back to all of them. But the, the <laughs> you <laughs> could look at, but you could look at a painting, which is just a stroke of colour. Mm. And you can have one or two, broadly speaking, have one or two reactions. Mm. One reaction is, How's that art? Mm. My kids can do that. Mm. A chimp can do that. You right. know, mm -hmm. he's got a, he's got a paintbrush. He's done a curve. I mean, I can hear, I can hear people I know, you know, saying, "Oh, what's? I, I don't know what it is." Yeah. How much is that? How much is that worth? It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. I could do that in I the garage that, with yeah. a bit of mat, mat emulsion. Um, <laughs> Love it when people say that. And I think sometimes, frankly, let's be honest. I think sometimes contemporary art is is Emperor's New Clothes. Mm. I think that sometimes, you know, there have been one or two of contemporary artists that when they've tried to paint in a more traditional old masterish way, yeah. they've failed. Mm -hmm. um, 
I read recently somebody from, I think it was the Royal Academy, actually, saying that students these days don't know how to draw the human form. Right, OK. And they don't even really want to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I wanted to try and be an artist, it'd be much easier for me to go and get some cardboard boxes and a bit of string and some corks and, you know, and, and say, you know, end of the world, you know. I, I, you know. Back to getting your paintings out again, Phil. But if I tried to paint mm -hmm. with the quality or even approaching the quality of a Monet or a Cezanne or a Titian or a Rembrandt, you would know that it's going to take you 20 years to even even get anywhere close. Yeah. Same thing in filmmaking. So if you're going to do it properly, it's a craft that you'd spend 10, 20, 30 years learning. But you can make a documentary with an iPhone, with one of these kind of cameras that has a video element yeah. to it and you can knock out something in your first year of filmmaker there's a qualitative difference now there's still the storytelling and maybe the person who makes a phone a film on their iphone tells a great story and there's a value in that i appreciate it but yes you can then but you can have a different way of looking at these paintings which is to say actually i don't think the art world i mean you know while there will be some people who are no doubt afraid to say, I don't get it, it's not very good. Mm. But actually, the general view is that his paintings are really very special. So mm. then, OK, well, hold on a minute. Before I dismiss it because I don't understand it or it seems too simple, let me try and understand what other people are seeing that I'm not seeing. And actually, perhaps, perhaps the earlier works more than the later works, but when you look at them... I, I I think they are very powerful. I think mm -hmm. he, he, and he helps because he gives you the titles, but actually if you stand and stare a little bit, like you said, you had a great week looking at his oh, paintings. I loved it. I think, I think he is a, a special artist, actually. I think he, his paintings are great. I mean, you know, we, we've dealt with, we've talked about artists and I've made films about artists that, like Van Gogh, that could do two paintings in a day. Yeah. Monet could be doing, you know, four canvases in the morning not necessarily finished but and here's a guy that might take four or seven years so he's obviously somebody that doesn't know when an artwork is finished and that's always an interesting thing with creative people when is it finished when is your book finished oh, when is a film yeah. finished but didn't um, you have a funny way of working as well as you turn them all to the wall and then put a canvas behind a uh, sort of in front of them and then would somehow sort of go back and get one out. Imagine waking up and thinking, oh, I'm going to go and have a little... Which one to work on? Yeah, which one can I work on? How, how do you... Well, again, he's sitting in his armchair, isn't he? Yeah. Working. Yeah. Probably got the radio on. <laughs> I mean, I think... I mean, I'm only getting... I mean, I watch the same film as you. And, yeah. Um, so the paintings are there. And it was great, by the way. And um, they're covered up, but, we're, you know, they were covered up. Maybe they were covered up. Actually, they're probably covered because when he's working on them, if he had them all out, that might be a bit overwhelming in terms of the colour. Yeah. They're obviously covered up also for the, oh, team, okay, for the cameras. Yeah. And then yes, when, yes. When they do reveal them, it's... It... I thought he did it all the time. No? It was just for the cameras. Oh, I, I, no, I don't know. Okay. No, I, I, I'd imagine, no, no, I don't. I imagine you kept them covered because otherwise you're just being reminded of 20 unfinished canvases. <laughs> But yeah. also those colours, obviously he was really impacted by colour. Was he the only person roughly at the time doing that sort of work do you know for his what was he 1932 to 2017 was anybody else really doing work like this well people talk about him as being unique i don't actually believe in unique artists myself i think there's always going to be artists working in a similar vein okay and often i think it's a bit sometimes people are being a bit narrow i'm just reading a book right now about russian art and you know, what they're doing in Russia at the same time and a little bit behind in some cases, as was happening at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century in, in Western Europe, they were similar. Of course, the people are influenced by each other. Yeah. Um, we're going you know, over to India and things. I mean, it's quite a thing. It's really, it's well, really, it's really special. Obviously, for... Okay, so I've been very lucky. I've gone to lots of countries. If you said to me, what's the most colourful country you've ever been to? Yeah. There is, I mean, immediately it's India. Okay. It I've is, never been there 
desperate to go. Yeah, so I think you would need to lie down every half an hour. You'd be so overwhelmed. I would. I know I would. I, I'd be, I'm desperate to go. I think it'd be amazing. Uh, you should definitely go. It is. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. See, Howard that, makes me want to go as well. See, I was lucky because, and it's true of, I was going to say it's true of any artist. I could be careful, not, but I mean... You've always got to be careful. Well, what I mean is <laughs> any creative person, there's lots of luck involved. In my case, my brother was living in India just as I was finishing school. And when I finished school, I wanted to be a photographer and I wanted to take a year off and I wanted to go and visit my brother in India. So I went with my camera on my own, met, cool. it, met him... And it was life-changing for lots of reasons. Now, you know, he could have had a job in, you know, Birmingham or, yeah. you know, yeah. just, but he, he was in India. Yeah. That's why I went to India. I might not have gone. Kids these days travel much more easily than I think Yes. the majority of kids did or could afford to, um, what, 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so you were really lucky. And India was absolutely, and in fact, India made me change from being a photographer to, to wanting to make films because it's such an assault on the senses in terms of sound and movement. And you think, I can't, I don't think I can capture this in black and white. It doesn't no. make sense. Or even in colour. Mm. Um, I want to use film to, to, to capture this kind of, in my case, my first film became about the Tibetans in exile who I'd encountered in, in northern India. So you do you think then from personal experience, that Howard does capture the colours yes. from India? So, colour. Mm. It is really interesting, I think, that we are, um, broadly speaking, a bit dull here in terms of colour. Your house is an exception. Your house, <laughs> your house, no, but your house is very colourful, and to some extent that reflects your character, which is very colourful. <laughs> That's why me and Howard would sort of get on, but not quite. <laughs> yeah, and his paintings would sit very nicely. I mean, oh, well, I'm sitting in a room which has there's one painting which is orange and green, and then you've got one which has got blues and yellows, mm. and, and then you've got one behind which is bright blue and a bit of brown. And, and I've got my orange velvet sofa, which yeah. we've just had recovered. It's the sofa we've had for donkey's years. So, you yeah. know, and then you talk about doing quilts and things. Is that one of yours there? Oh, it is, yeah. So brilliant and multicoloured. Yes. Now, if you go out... Mm-hmm. onto the streets i think there's a lot of blacks and a lot of grays and a lot of browns if you go to i mean not only india obviously but if you go to india it is just i mean every space is painted i mean the trucks the you know the yeah, the, yeah. the the um lorries even more so in pakistan but i mean just an assault and it's interesting one of the things one needs to understand going off on a bit of a tangent here but if when you look at Greek statues, yes. Roman statues. <laughs> you tend to think of them as being white, pristine marble, don't you? Mm. Um, that actually isn't the reality. First of all, that was quite expensive, that type of art. So it's marble and it's, and, or, or other hard-wearing, long-lasting materials. But a lot of popular art was quite different, but it, 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 was, it was smashed, it was broken deteriorated it might be made in wood so you're getting getting a particular type of art that survives and a lot of that art would have been very brightly painted so the venus de milo for example which is in the louvre yeah we look at it now and we admire the fact that it's beautiful white marble it was painted oh okay so it had really garish white to our to my eyes to our eyes red lipstick and blue eyeshadow and gold this and bright yellow that um and the fronts of temples, we might look at them now and they're all white, but actually at the time, the kind of the plinths and the columns would all have been So they all just, is it just all worn off? It's all worn off, it's all been washed away. So what you're left with is the marble underneath. Amazing. So So colour. I didn't know that. And, and, I really know. have learned something new today. But also, if you, so if you go, to the, go to ancient Egypt, somewhere else to put on your list if you haven't been. I have actually managed to, I told you, I, I, told you, I have actually been to Cairo. You've been to Cairo, okay. Yeah. Well, well, again. But only for the day. How come you went to Cairo for the day? Because <laughs> I got, I happened to be in Cyprus, yeah. and then I did this boat trip over, uh, landed at Port Alex, is it Alexander? Alexandria, yeah. yeah. And then got a little coach trip in, oh, nice. did Cairo for the day, got on a camel, obviously. Around the pyramid? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, you know, you can imagine, can't you? Brilliant. I thought, well, I'm here now. Definitely worth doing. It was amazing, but I didn't really do 
That's anything, still coming. You know, that probably you would have done, Phil. No, no, no. <laughs> I, might, I, I would have, I would have <laughs> given the camel a miss. I must have <laughs> Next but, time, then, we'll, do, we'll have to do a camel. <laughs> Sorry. But if you go down <laughs> the Nile, or up the Nile, yes. Okay, yeah, I've definitely not done that. Go to Luxor, mm. and then if you look in the tombs, they are so brightly coloured. So the ancient world, colour was as much as they could with the with the colours they had available to them. Yeah. Obviously, that changes through time as well. Um, and, you know, the, the history of colour is really, really interesting. Lapis lazuli. Again, I love going off on tangents. Lapis lazuli. <laughs> you got to warn me, though. OK, warning. <laughs> Tangent warning. <laughs> For Laura. <laughs> lapis lazuli is that beautiful blue stone and it comes from basically one mountain in afghanistan oh, okay Amazing. because it's so rare it's extremely expensive and the, one of the reasons that the venetian empire was so successful for three four hundred years was because they became the center of color of pigments lapis lazuli being one of them so because when Amazing. you get this if you grind it down you get a beautiful blue yeah it wasn't you know, when we, again, when we look at paintings, you kind of think, oh, yeah, that's, that's you know, we kind of look at, if you look at Jesus and he's, he's got a beard, it wasn't always the case he'd have a beard. It wasn't always the case he would look whiter than perhaps they actually were in that part of the world at the time that he was alive. Same with Mary. Mary is usually depicted wearing blue. Yeah. The reason she's wearing blue, there's no, no historical evidence for what colour she would have worn. The reason no. she's wearing blue is because it was really expensive. Ah, and, it's, and therefore, you would paint the person with the most expensive colour to say this person's important. In the same way that you would give the most, Jesus would be given a golden halo. Yes. You know, because it's like saying, yeah. one, that we can afford it, and two, we're, we're going to attribute this. I think I've told you before about the, the crushed sea snails in purple. No. So this is a brilliant story. So, so I... Who on I mean, the thing that always gets me is who discovered this, but somebody discovered that sea snails, I'm like, I mean, if you crush them, yeah. <laughs> you produce a purple pigment, a purple colour. Right. But again, this is really time consuming, so it's very expensive. Yeah. So Roman senators, to show off their wealth, would dye their togas right. with a purple uh, diagonal stripe. Oh, I love this. Okay? Yeah. Because well, it's basically like people today wearing gold, you right. know, or somebody or footballers wearing expensive watches. Yes. It's just showing off, isn't right. it? Right. And um, so they would wear a purple diagonal stripe made out of this crushed sea snails. Julius Caesar comes along. Yeah. Julius Caesar is a model in how to take power. And, you know, any modern politician can learn an awful lot, and I'm sure some of them have by, stu <laughs> by studying Julius Caesar. Okay. So one of the things he does... <laughs> Is he doesn't have? It's like well, I'm not just going to wear one gold bangle. I'm wearing gold everywhere. I'm, right. going, I'm going full gold. So he starts wearing a toga which is completely purple. Oh, okay. So he's basically saying to the rest of the Roman population. Well, not, he's not. He says different things to different parts of the Roman population. But he's saying to other senators, "Look at me. I am really flash." And he's done that with these sea snails. So he's got this oh, very expensive this. pigment. He's got an entire toga. Yeah. Jump forward a little bit, you then, so Julius Caesar becomes the first emperor. Yeah. Because when initially you had two senators ruling as consuls together for a year at a time and power was like shared around and nobody could ever, the one thing the Romans didn't want was monarchy. Julius Caesar gets into power, and there's a whole big story about Julius Caesar, but he gets into power, he then becomes consul for life, which is basically like an emperor, like a king. Anyway, he becomes the first emperor, wearing purple. He's followed by his nominated successor, a guy that we, we now know of. As, his name was Octavian. We now know of him as Augustus. Uh -huh. And he, he takes the family name of Caesar, hence Caesars. Right. And Caesar becomes the name of the person that rules Rome, and it becomes a dynasty, a family dynasty. The first family are fairly mixed shall we say you've got an augustus you've got a nero you've got um claudius i mean these are all kind of very different personalities but they're all caesars but they're all wearing purple, purple. Oh, jump okay. forwards okay and end kind of the end of the roman empire you get to the popes yes 
So even today, well, actually, popes today wear white, but even, but the popes were wearing purple. So even today, if you go to the church, purple's still an important colour. It all goes back to some fisherman who thought, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, what happens if I crush that? That's amazing. It produces a purple colour. So colour... No, Phil, you, the point is, next time we go to a toga party... <laughs> Full purple. We're going to have purple. Full purple. <laughs> We've got to make the entrance. None so, of these white sheets with the, you know, I'm, um, full I'm purple. In. Full in fact, purple. I've got. I'm, I don't know. You, this is it now. I think I've got a purple. Anyway, well, you've um, got a purple toga. Yeah. Well, we. How did you manage that? Well, because we made when we made our series oh, yeah, about Roman history, <laughs> we did some reenactments. <laughs> okay. With, with a purple toga, with somebody wearing a purple toga. <laughs> um, this is too good. How did we get onto this? But the other thing about colour. <laughs> which is also really interesting. And artists started really, really studying it in the 19th century. Mm. Not for the first time, but it really was the impact colour has on us as humans. Now, to what extent is going to be different in, in India than England or Australia to Azerbaijan, I'm not expert enough to say. But we've talked about this before, there's no question that colour is as a real, really visceral, energetic... Yeah. You know, it, it makes us feel alive and enthusiastic. And we did talk about yellow with Van Gogh's sunflowers. And mm. That's a beautiful yellow. I mean, mm. it'd be very unusual to see a sky like that. But it's, it's, it's kind of... Mm. You know, Leonardo would have had that as, you know, pale blue mm. going off into the background. Oh, yeah, what you said um, before. Mm. And again here... You know, th there is some colour theory going on here, contrasting colours, complementary colours. So you've got the greens and the reds, they're complementary. Um, and then you've got your blue, kind of your blue and yellow kind of. Yeah, there's blue and yellow to the right. Yeah. So that's, you know, all part of the colour wheel. So... It'd be nice to know what Mrs Acton was actually wearing, do you not think? Because I'm not really quite sure what she's... If you were going to try and interpret that, well, I was wondering that, and I thought, actually, mm. I reckoned, but I'm making it up, I think she's got a kind of big white blousy number going on. Yeah. And then, but she's got the, the you know, when you, you typically see um, teenagers kind of hitchhiking around India and they've got the kind of baggy, <laughs> oh, yeah. light, airy trousers. So she's, I, I think those... Those, so that's what they are. Okay. But, you know... You can, yeah, I mean, we are making it up. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> that's our little secret, Laura. Don't say it's that. Really, I don't know. I think these. I think everyone's getting the drift of these podcasts now. But then, but no, I'm making it up. For sure. But the but the the blue and the red stripe. Yeah. I mean, that could be. I think he did one called Bermuda shorts or something. He did, yeah. And that's yeah. just that's just red shorts, isn't it? Yeah, that's cool. But one thing I do love about him is that where he goes off onto the frames later yeah. on, yeah. Which I think I would do, because you know when you start a painting and it's meant to be all you know, yeah. you get to the bottom, you're like, oh, I've run out of space. It's yeah. really annoying. Yeah. I didn't quite manage it. And then he 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 seems to, I don't know if he does this later on, but then he goes off onto the frame, and I think that yeah, I, I love the way he does that. He's like, it doesn't want to be. There's no borders. I don't want a border on this. I just want to get involved with that frame mm. so it does break down the border between the painting and the the wall which it's is funny hung. why he does it though isn't it do we have any reasons for that we didn't i i couldn't find any information on that particularly i've always thought it's because he just didn't like the finite lines that no, you know otherwise either. otherwise when you're framing something it's yeah. like it's like looking out of a window isn't it it's it's actually it's a better example would be if you look out of a window and it's a bright day and the light coming in means mm. the edge is slightly soft. I think he was trying to achieve that. But, of course, Laura, the whole thing, it might just be an affectation. He might have thought, oh, I'll do this, it's different. Yeah. But um, maybe, actually, he might have... It. One thing, it might have been really good, he might have recycled his frames. Therefore... Well, that's tricky, though, isn't it? Frames... Well, that's what I'm saying. He would have just got them out of a, out of a, you know, a skip or something. Oh, I see, recycled and before he's used yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. Stick them on. Think, oh, I don't really like that anyway. And... Uh, if not, you wouldn't want to be his picture framer, would you? You'd be a bit disappointed because every single frame is... Yeah, I wonder if he made his own <laughs> if he made his own frames. Oh, maybe, yeah. It's quite interesting. But I really like the way he does that. And I mean, I again, that's I something... I would love to know why. That is something to bear in mind when you go to a gallery that they're almost certainly not framed in the frame that 
artist had intended. No. Because frames deteriorate. Mm. I mean, um, Van Gogh, um, there's a photograph of one of the paintings in its original frame. It's quite a modest orange frame. Now you might go to the Musée d'Orsay or some major gallery and it'd be some ostentatious frame. Oh, That's, yeah, yeah. you know, Van Gogh would hate that. I think something interesting. That's I interesting. I think it's something interesting. I did learn about frames not so long ago. It's some of these really ostentatious ones, you know, the kind of gilded yellows. Yes. Um, they were done very deliberately because, um, obviously, before electricity, these paintings are often hung in, in environments which will become dark. Okay. Maybe at the end of the day, or maybe even indoors, they're quite dark. Um, sometimes the frame might have a little ledge at the bottom where you might put two candles. Either way, if you look at some of these gilded frames, actually kind of they're gold, but, you know, and quite um, uh, reflective, and they kind of almost curve in. And part of the point of this was to reflect light Not back onto the picture. Oh, that's great. So it's quite clever. And particularly if you have candles, maybe yeah. on either side or maybe yeah. on a little ledge underneath them. It's just kind of knocking light around. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think it's up to... To some extent, I could understand if people look at it and go, you know, it's not for me. I prefer the clarity of a Leonardo face or I prefer the 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 realist realism and yet impressionism of a Monet or a Cezanne. But I yeah. think so much is captured by by this. Mm. They're also quite fun to look at because you start yeah. if you start looking, you think, okay, so I can see the curve. I imagine I can kind of imagine the architecture, and you've got—is that a wooden beam that's there? Okay, and she's. They start looking a bit more carefully. This is probably some kind of divan that she's on, or chair. Yeah. I really love the black in this, though. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, well, it draws out all the Straight colour. Straight through the middle. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you'll know what you're going to say to me. Well, that's the no, 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 the triangly no. bit. No. But uh, I find that the green squares slightly unusual mm. I don't know whether that's supposed to be kind of like a wall a brick wall out yeah. there one of those walls that's kind of and maybe that's that could be a sh the blue top right could be like a sheet blowing in the wind or I Even mean that part of the, the pinky the pink mm. in, the, in the sky mm. oh it's so oh, I love this and you can I mean I can understand why it would take him ages and ages because yeah. you could look at that and keep playing with it couldn't you yeah well if you imagine if you went to one of his, I'm, I can't imagine anybody going to an exhibition and not coming out with a smile on their face. Can you? I'm sure there's people that don't like it then. Depends how much, depends how much you're charged to get in. Oh, that's the point, yeah. <laughs> and if there's a coffee shop at the end. I mean, if it's, if it's a £35 <laughs> ticket. I can't we always get to food. I mean, he called uh, them, he called his works evocations of emotional situations. But he didn't say a whole lot. I mean, this actually, I think, I'm not sure that's necessarily quite as appropriate for this because this is somebody in a location. Yeah. The other ones, and even the ones you mentioned, are actually still, you can actually kind of see when you know the title that it's yes. a fruit crumble or an ice cream. Ice cream. Mm. But some when it's just strokes of colour. Although in um, ice cream, and I'm sure people will have to look for that now, but there is this two big strokes of blue which, when mm. I looked at it, I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. And maybe that's the sea? I couldn't work that out at all. But I'm sure there'll be somebody telling. But I guess it's... Hopefully telling us, which has been nice, because we've had some really nice comments. Mm. Because we do get it wrong. <laughs> I definitely do. <laughs> we do, Phil. Come on. <laughs> so someone may know exactly what those blue lines are. Mm. Like, what are you talking about, Laura? Well... Mm. There we are. I think the thing that's not unlike about this painting is that going back to the colour is is the impact that different colours have on well, on me in this case. But there are different types of blue there. And it's yeah. just you just you can keep looking and keep seeing new things. And the relationship between the white and the red and the blue and the red and the blue and the green and the green and the black. Yeah, and that the tiles, well, I'm assuming they're tiles, the green and the orange. Yeah. It's absolutely lovely. Yeah. And it's a perfect green with that orange. 
and somehow actually he's managed to con it's it's extraordinary really because it's clearly only just a human form mm. you probably you might just about know but somehow you they just feel tired don't they i mean it looks like the end of a hot day yeah and they're just something exhausted about the way they're sitting there really interesting last week i went to um the yorkshire sculpture park just north of sheffield and um, I think Lottie's been there. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, she's I think definitely she told me about this. definitely worth a visit. Yeah. But there they had some um, sculptures again of human forms, and it doesn't take much to represent a human form. It can be a square block, like two square blocks beneath to be the legs, and maybe a little square block on top of the bigger square block. Yeah, which is the, and that's it. That's how you feel on a Monday morning when you get out of bed. <laughs> 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 and then by the end of the week, you've got a bit more, a few more blocks. <laughs> but it's like, and is know, that your, is that is that one of the sculptures there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, there's some brilliant ones. And that there's a whole that particular group. There's a whole family. It could be Hepworth. There's a whole family, and um, I mean, our our human brain wants to break things down to to simple forms. In a way, when we read words. We're not. I mean, sometimes we're getting the word from the shape of the word. We just. We, our brain wants to oh, do yeah, things yeah. quickly. Yes. So part of this is also our brains, because our brain has to react. You know how if if you're about to fall down the stairs or mm. somebody pulls out in front of you, your adrenal glands work in a split second, or you see something out your peripheral vision. So your brain can work unbelievably quick. So the whole time your brain is analysing things. So when it sees a picture, it, it immediately wants to understand what it is. And that's why you have to like slow down and go, hold on a minute, yeah. you might be wrong. Mm. But of course, first impression is, well, first impression is, for me, architectural space, sunset. Right. Could be, could be summarised for all I know, but my brain says sunset for some reason. I think sunset, like you said, she looks tired. Yeah, but I'm not sure I'd know that was a person straight away. Okay, but that's the title again. But then when I see the title... Mm. Yeah, no, you're right. You would. Could have and something, anything, really. And something about the choice of name, Acton, you think, mm. you know, because you, you can imagine a Lord and Lady Acton, and she's just a Mrs. Mm. Just, but I mean... Mm. Um, and then Delhi, I mean, like, you know, Delhi can be so hot. Yeah. Um... But the brain, again, is constantly trying to work it out. And I'm sure that artists play with that, don't they? They play with our need to understand. And so they kind of, there's enough there that gives you some clues, but there's not enough so you totally get it. And so that's the last thing I wanted to, to, to talk about in terms of somebody like Hodgkin is that, like music, art, there's always three parties in in. <laughs> the famous Lady Diana line, you know, there's three people in this marriage. There's always, oh, yeah. there's always three people engaged, involved. So when you listen, when you look at the work of a composer, you have, you have the composer, you have the performer, but you also have the listener. And I think you have to always remember with a painting, a painting is only made by the person looking at it. So you have the artist. Yeah. You have the subject matter. Mm-hmm. But you also have the person looking. And I think artists can have different attitudes towards that. Same as a filmmaker. How much, how much do we try to second guess what a, a, a viewer is thinking? Wow. Now, I do a lot of that, but it's dangerous because I might have an audience of 300 people and I'm trying to assume they're all going to be asking the same questions at the same time. Yeah. The reality is you, you can't assume that. But an artist like Hodgkin, does he take into account what the person will think when they walk into the gallery or wherever this painting was hung, does he take into account what they will think, what their experiences are, or does he completely discount that? I doubt it. I think he's playing with the audience a bit. I think he's just giving you enough so you get a sense of it, but not so much. Yeah. He has to discount it a little bit, though, because like you say, you're going to come in, mm. everybody has had a different life. Mm. And everybody is going to see that differently. You've been to India. I haven't. Mm. Make so a that's an instant. Mm. So 
and then there's the commerce side. I mean, you know, when his painting started selling, he started becoming popular. So, yeah. of course, then the temptation is to you know, do more of the same. I mean, there were those that said at his last show that perhaps there was a sense of, you know, um, not they weren't quite as strong as his early works. Often with artists, mm. the, the older they get, the better their works get. Yeah. Because they're less, cons- they, they're financially more stable, they're less concerned with what other people think. They've learned over 30, 40 years how to do what they want to do. But also, he's getting older, he, may, he got more frail. Yeah. He probably just wanted to carry on. Yeah. There's one thing as you're getting more frail, you just got to keep on going, haven't yeah. you? As soon as you stop, I think he said about his eyesight, he never lost his eyesight, which is incredible. Oh, well, that's lucky. But the other parts of him sort of fell apart. Oh, OK. So uh, I can really relate to that. If you can see those colours mm. and recreate them. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, like you say, people might have said oh, it was not so good, but he was just keeping going. So, Howard Hodgkin. Yes. Definitely worth many looks. I want to go and see. And definitely an worth exhibition. a trip to India. Yes. All right. Thank you, Laura. Uh-huh. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time. <laughs>